Hello, everyone. Welcome to this online info session about um, the six core for projects at ALIF, which is the International Foundation uh, Alliance for the Protection of Heritage um, in Conflict Areas. Um, I am Elke. I'm not sure whether you can see me, actually. Um, but I'm the program director at ALIF, and I will be um, talking to you this morning um, together with a number of colleagues, uh, a bit of practical information um, to start with. Um, there is translation available from English to French, and for that, uh, you have to um, click the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. It looks like this. I think you can see my mouse move. Uh, donc pour ceux qui sont francophones, il y a de la traduction disponible uh, à travers cette, uh, uh, cette uh, uh, fonction en, en bas de, de votre écran. Um, there will also be a possibility to ask questions, uh, and these are only possible via the Q&A tab um, to see here also at the bottom of your screen. And we will answer your questions, or at least as many questions as possible, um, at the end of the session. Uh, we will not be able to answer project-specific questions, so questions of the style, I have a project in mind, X, Y, Z, is that something you can fund? Uh, we'd rather have them formulated a bit more broadly so that they apply to as many participants as possible, if you have very particular questions related to a specific project that you have in mind, you're always welcome uh, to email us uh, at grants at alifoundation.org. And that's also an email address that you can find in several places on, on our website and the guidelines for uh, the call for projects. Um, and then just as a last mention, this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available um, to, to watch online uh, in both languages, in both English and French, uh, after, uh, after today. So what are we going to do today? I'm going to briefly introduce you to Alif and the type of work that we do. We're going to discuss the call um, for projects, our specific objectives and selection criteria, um, we're going to talk about the online application, um, we're going to talk about the financial guidelines and due diligence that will be required uh, in order to be uh, considered for funding. I'm um, going to finish with a very brief timeline on how we see uh, the next steps in this call, and then there will be an opportunity um, where we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. You're welcome to submit questions while I'm talking, but the answer will come uh, at the very end, unless some of my colleagues can already answer you in writing um, during the, the call. Uh, also, just to mention, I know there is a hand raising function, but we cannot see that. So please just use the Q&A. Um, if you raise your hands, there, there is nothing um, we, we can do to, to help you out other than when you explicitly uh, explain the problem in the Q&A. So about Alif, what, what are we? We are a, a foundation based in Geneva, Switzerland. We were created in March, 2017. And initially our, our mandate was uh, to finance and support, uh, also technically support, projects uh, related to the protection of heritage in conflict and post-conflict areas. And since this year, uh, we uh, are now also working on uh, mitigating and combating the impacts of climate change um, on cultural heritage. Uh, Alive is a public-private partnership, so we have uh, a mixture of public and private donors, including uh, eight member states, and you see them listed uh, there on the slide, as well as a, a whole lot of other uh, contributors and were hosted uh, by Switzerland. And we are, um, as I already mentioned, a scientific and financial instrument, which means that we, we fund projects, but we also um, accompany projects uh, in a more scientific 
manner. Uh, there's a, a timeline at the bottom of the slide with very tiny uh, fonts, but where you can see kind of how from our creation in 2016, things have evolved over, over the past, uh, let's say six, seven years, with the first projects adopted in 2018. Um, our areas of intervention, so we used to work in conflict and post-conflict areas with a very broad definition of conflict. We continue to do so. Um, so definitely conflict areas, which are also affected by climate change, are very welcome to apply uh, to this uh, call for projects. But we have also the particular new objective uh, to work on the fight against climate change. And that can also be in countries that are not affected um, by conflict. Uh, we act uh, in a in preventative um, manner, uh, but we also act during emergencies that can be during conflicts and during uh, climate uh, caused uh, uh, emergencies, and we can work after some rehabilitation, reconstruction, conservation, restoration, all that kind of things, and we work on a very broad concept of heritage. So. Whereas a lot of our projects, if you look through our website, uh, where you can find uh, an overview of some of the projects that we've been financing, a lot of it is about tangible heritage, so monuments and sites, more and more also uh, museums and their collections, documentary heritage, and uh, we tend to try to have a, a bit of a holistic approach in which also the intangible components linked to to um, to heritage are um, are taken into account. Thus far, we've financed very few projects that are purely on intangible heritage, but it is an option. So it is not excluded to apply with a project that's just about intangible heritage. Um, natural heritage has not been part of our focus, and it's also not the primary focus uh, of this current call on climate change. Uh, we do will consider uh, mixed sites, so where like cultural landscapes, where, where um, built heritage, tangible heritage, and natural heritage are intersecting. And this is just an overview, it's the most recent one, so at the end of last year, of all the countries where we're currently active. Um, we are supporting, or we have thus far supported around 450 projects around the world in 35 different countries. As you can see, there's already quite a bit of countries in Africa where we have a presence. Um, very often with a relatively small number of projects. There's a few countries where we've been more active, like, like Mali, like Libya, like Sudan, uh, Ethiopia, but in, in many of the others, it's, it's uh, been limited thus far. And so one of the ideas under the current call is to scale up our presence and our number of projects uh, all over the African continent. Second, uh, so we'll talk about the current call, the objectives and the eligibility, and I'll first hand over to my colleague Bestia, who will talk about our broader strategy on climate change. Bestia. Thank you, Elke. Um, See, so I'm Bestia, I'm a director of strategy, and the goal here is just to give you a little bit of context about um, where this particular call for project fits, um, that is, within the broader climate change and cultural heritage strategy, which ALIF is implemented um, uh, actively uh, as of this year. Um, so the sort of the, the, the basic um, issues that, that we had identified along with many others was that climate change is indeed impacting cultural heritage around the world, both the tangible heritage, tangible heritage, movable heritage, documentary heritage. Um, through different, very different processes, actually, um, depending on the areas, right? Um, but we also believe that cultural heritage uh, can play a role, right, in this fight against climate change. Uh, there are traditional knowledge systems um, that can offer um, strategies of uh, adaptation, mitigations. Um, there are different alternatives uh, to uh, using uh, materials, uh, technologies uh, in order to build uh, to provide um, initiatives that are more uh, sustainable, uh, produce less carbon as well, 
So uh, the idea is also to look for local and sustainable solutions uh, that uh, may have been developed over the past centuries um, in and still in use in uh, some areas around the world. So it's both looking at cultural heritage uh, as a victim, but also uh, as a tool uh, to fight climate change. And next slide, please. Um, so that, um, Alka, um, thank you. So the, the goal of Aleph through this strategy um, is to develop different type of projects, approaches, but also funding mechanisms uh, to address, well, first on the, the more advocacy side, the cultural heritage as a tool for climate action, right? So culture-based climate action, uh, which is leading us to get involved with different type of partners um, and act uh, in the framework of the COPs. Uh, and then the next one is to launch this program to protect tangible and intangible heritage impacted by climate change by supporting concrete protection and rehabilitation projects, contributing to the dissemination of traditional know-how, but also supporting research experiments uh, to promote new conceptual and technical solutions. That is why, I mean, those sort of three approaches are those that you're going to find uh, throughout our core for projects of conservation rehabilitation, also capacity building, and then research. Uh, thank you, Elke. Thank you, Bastien. Um... So just as a, as a very brief summary of what this call is, and then we'll get more into some of the details, um, we look at, in terms of priorities, at the intersection climate change, culture, heritage, and Africa. That's the core priority. It's not, if you read through the guidelines, it's not absolutely exclusive. So we are ready to accept solid proposals on climate change outside of Africa, for instance, or projects in Africa that are more conflict related. It is an option, but the core of this call is this intersection of these three um, domains. Um, we will pay a lot of attention to the impact of the projects. Um, so in terms of the effective potential to contribute to combating climate change, um, but also in terms of um, the training job opportunities that are provided, how many people are engaged locally in the project, how many people can benefit from this and, and so on and so forth. Um, it is important that the project itself in the way it is set up demonstrates that it's sustainable, but also that it, it pays attention to its carbon footprint, for instance, to the social impact. I've put peace building there, but we can we can broaden that to, to the wider social uh, impact of a project. Since we're, we're in a call for climate change, it's particularly important. I can just add the example, you know, we don't want a project um, that consists of five experts flying around the world for the entire project, uh, if this is something that could be done locally, for instance. We're not against uh, international involvement, uh, just, just as a footnote, uh, but try, you know, to be as mindful as possible to, if you have a project on combating climate change, to not be part of the cost, but part of the solution. Um, and we do very much encourage local operators as much as possible to apply. It can be in partnership with international operators, uh, but we would really like to see a lot of applications from local organizations. Um, we're gonna fund three types of projects. So there's the operational projects, conservation, for instance, uh, capacity building and actionable research. Uh, there's much more details on this in the guidelines to the call. Um, and we also very much encourage projects that combine two or even three of these types of projects. So an operational project that has an on-the-job training included or operational project linked to research, um, research and capacity building combined um, and so forth. Possible areas of interest, and these are not exclusive, but um, we're very much interested in um, areas where there's a lot of coastal erosion and sea level rise, um, areas with extreme desertification or, or, or desert climates, which are, are facing uh, particular challenges of increased uh, precipitation, for instance, 
um, urgent and architecture and the specific challenges that urgent and architecture is facing vis-a-vis um, -vis climate change, but also I think especially in relation to urgent and architecture, the opportunities they may offer for uh, um, for durable solutions. Um, we'll look at fragile collections, both documentary heritage and um, museum collections. Doesn't have to be in a museum, can also uh, objects in private uh, ish collections. Uh, and uh, because we're Alive and we've, we have a very, I mean, not a long, but our entire existence works on conflict, we do remain uh, interested in the nexus between climate change, conflict, and cultural heritage, of course. Um, so a little bit more on these three categories of projects. With operational projects, we really refer to uh, protection of sites or, or, or institutions, collections, uh, conservation, rehabilitation. Um, it can be, include things like conservation plans or disaster reduction plans. It can include emergency measures uh, or sheltering, uh, stabilization of, of structures, but all the way up to full on conservation rehabilitation. And in terms of these operational projects, uh, we have quite a bit of a scope in terms of scale. So it can be uh, smaller sites uh, that really need attention, but it can also be the kind of the bigger, more symbolic um, heritage sites in Africa, uh, preferably that, that, um, that are particularly suffering uh, from the effects of climate change. Then the second is capacity building. So we, we traditionally have not supported um, purely workshops or conferences, things like that. But we do have um, supported a lot of on the job training initiatives. And I think that is the direction in which we're still looking. So really on the ground training of the next generation of experts, um, it doesn't have to be in technical conservation skills only. So we, we will uh, support projects that include also strengthening of administrative skills of local NGOs, for instance, preferably, as I said before, preferably in linkage to like a conservation project. Um, so where one of the outcomes of the project would be to have much stronger local um, NGOs or civil society capacities for managing uh, this kind of projects. Uh, we will consider crisis management, emergency documentation and concepts so of training on, right? Um, emergency documentation and conservation on uh, damage and needs assessments, on site management, on specific conservation rehabilitation skills, on transfer of knowledge, but also on heritage project management. So like grant writing, financial reporting, um, and then the third is actionable research. Again, we're, we're not looking for, um, for very sterile research projects, uh, but for research that's directly linked to the issues on the ground and that preferably are in direct connection to the operational projects or to capacity building so that where we can see uh, there is a, a direct link between the research component that is included and um, and a, a very concrete um, action-oriented project. Um, in terms of selection criteria, and you can find these as well in, in the guidelines for the call. So there's four categories which are relevance, quality, feasibility, sustainability, and impact. So with relevance, we, we will look at, and these are the criteria according to which your projects will be evaluated, right? Um, evaluation, just maybe as a, as a side note, evaluation is done both internally and externally. So we have uh, our, our expert team here in the office who will look through um, all applications, but we also have uh, a pool of external experts who will uh, provide us with their comments on the suggested projects. And then we have a scientific committee and a foundation board who will uh, go through uh, the, the, the suggested list of, of projects to be supported. So in terms of relevance, uh, this relates to the level and the, and the 
the level of the threats and the damage to the heritage concerned. So you'll be you'll have to uh, demonstrate that the site or the area that you're proposing is really at risk, has already been affected, or is in uh, in a, a place or or constructed in a particular way uh, that is highly likely to suffer from the impacts of climate change. Um, we prefer um, sites of which it can be demonstrated that they're locally very important. Um, Complementarity with other initiatives, you can see that in two ways. We don't want overlap. We don't want projects that are already funded or dealt with by other donors. But at the same time, we, we do uh, encourage projects that are building on existing initiatives or that can take existing or prior initiatives once one step further. Um, and relevance is also uh, related to, and then especially I think for some types of these projects, to uh, the, the, the potential that uh, the application has for, for really concrete outcomes, concrete results, especially if, if you have a research proposal, um, for instance. Um, in terms of quality, we'll look at the scientific rationale of your project. Um, so once you've established what the threat is, what the risk is that this particular heritage is facing. We do want to see a rationale that explains that the solution that your project is supposed to offer actually links to the to the to the threat that you have identified, that there is a clear link between A and B. Um, we do encourage uh, proper monitoring and evaluation within your project. And that's especially also important for projects that are not implemented by teams that have a full-time presence on the site. Um, it's important you know, for, for all our projects, but it's especially important uh, for projects that are kind of managed a bit remotely. Um, there's of course a technical appraisal, so, so um, the the of the solutions that are offered we will look at all the activities that are proposed and into what extent the proposed activities um let's say make sense or are of sufficiently high quality um to um to be able to protect the heritage in question but also to to live up to the necessary international standards uh for heritage preservation. Uh, and of course, we'll look very much in detail uh, at uh, the proposed budget and the extent into which the budget is realistic, offers um, offers a kind of value for money um, and, and, and is properly linked to the activities that are proposed. Um, in terms of feasibility and sustainability, We'll look at the financial capacity of the applicant. Uh, we'll look at uh, the sustainability of the proposed activities and the proposed uh, kind of project solutions as a whole. Um, and that also links to um, involvement of community, for instance, uh, of local authorities where relevant. Um, it looks at, you know, how is... A, a property that is 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 being uh, renovated, for instance, by an external uh, NGO. How is that going to be sustained by the owners or the users of the building once the project is over? And into what extent are there elements built into your project to make sure um, that uh, that this is going to happen? Um, we, and I already mentioned that in some of the other criteria, but the understanding of the local reality, um, especially also in, 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 in conflict affected areas is of extreme importance. Uh, we don't want your project in, to have in any way a negative impact on very fragile uh, conflict or, or social dynamics in the area that you're um, planning to work in. Um, I already mentioned the involvement of local actors in our communities. Um, and then there's uh, the local versus international involvement. So we we um, 
we accept both. Uh, we accept definitely also combinations of both. So an international applicant, which works in very close partnership with local organizations. Um, but the, the, the balance between uh, the both needs to make sense for this particular project and there needs to be a, a clear justification as to why for instance there's an international partner involved if the local ngo does does for instance 95 percent of the work that there needs to be a certain logic even though for us all possible options are there but it's important um in order where vis-a-vis um, -vis our, our evaluation criteria to be able to demonstrate why this particular setup of the project implementation team has been selected. Um, and then the last one in terms of impact. So we'll look at uh, across three domains. So the economic impact of your project, and that is during the project implementation and after. During in terms of uh, local procurement, uh, job creation, which is often directly linked to the project implementation. But um, if there's projects, for instance, that include on the job training that can have, or or at least envisage a longer term economic impact um, that is, is very much encouraged. We were quite mindful for the social, cultural or peace building impact of your project. Um, and of course, because this is uh, primarily about climate change, we do will look at the environmental impact um, as well. Um, and then I'll hand over to Adonis, uh, who will talk you through some of the main steps or main things to know about the Smart Simple application, which is the tool that is um, used to uh, apply online. For, for these grants. So Adonis, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Elke. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Adonis, and I'm a project manager at the Aleph Foundation. And as Elke mentioned, I will just go through very briefly about the steps that you would need to uh, do in order to submit um, an application on Smart Simple. Thank you. So uh, w one of the easiest ways to do this, uh, like if you would like to reach uh, our uh, Smart Simple platform, is you just go on our web page uh, and in the grant section, you will see that there's a specific uh, section dedicated to our call for projects. And here we include a screenshot of what you are supposed to see on our web page uh, there. Uh, here it's quite straightforward. Uh, on this page, you will find the guidelines. Um, and if you're viewing the page in English, you would see the guidelines in English. And if you would like to have the French version, you would just switch the web page into uh, into French, and you're going to find a link to the guidelines in um, in French. Uh, what is important is this apply button that you see in white over the blue background. Uh, you would just click on this uh, apply button, and it will take you to the um, Smart Simple uh, platform. And you will see that the uh, deadline is the 21st of November. Uh, by 3 p.m. Central European time. And uh, just to let you know that applications that uh, have been uh, not submitted before this deadline will not be uh, submittable. I mean, the platform will simply uh, not allow you to um, submit the application after that. So it would be important to um, finish whatever you need to do uh, and submit the application uh, beforehand if, if you would like uh, to apply. Next slide, please. Thank you. So once once you click on apply on our web page, you would see that uh, it will take you to this. Um, th this is how this is how the login page of our smart simple platform looks like. So you would see that there is a login. Uh, uh, on one hand, if you're a user who has already been uh, let's say familiar with Aleph and you have already submitted applications to us through the platform, you can just log in using your credentials. Um, uh, uh, so th this is for uh, those who are already registered uh, on our platform. For new users, you would see that there's another blue button, um, register here, uh, where you would just click it and you would fill uh, a very simple, um, I mean, uh, a simple form with your uh, name, uh, uh, which organization do you present, uh, the email address, and basically you will be able to um, register. 
Uh, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So here, uh, once once you uh, have registered and once you log in into your profile on Smart Simple, this is what uh, you're going to see as an applicant. Uh, so you would see that there are two funding opportunities um, open, and these would be the call for projects uh, that uh, is the subject of this um, information session. And there's another mechanism, which is the emergency relief. Um, so this is what you're supposed to see here. And for those who have already uh, started filling out their uh, applications and have saved them, uh, and this is very important uh, to note here that uh, you don't have to submit the application uh, in the same session when you're logged in. I mean, you're able to uh, log in, uh, take a look at the forms, uh, save it, uh, because I imagine that it would take you some time to uh, go through everything and provide all the documentation. Uh, it's going to be saved on the platform and you can return back to it anytime, anytime, anytime you want and as many times as you need. So for those who have already started filling, it, filling applications, you're going to see them here in progress. So you would just click on in progress and you're going to see, um, you're going to see, uh, the application that you have already started. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, so here, um, for those, uh, what, what, once uh, you click on the funding opportunities, you're going to see um, uh, the two opportunities are the call for projects, which we were talking about, and then there's the emergency relief grant, which is not the subject uh, here. But I would just like to note that please try not to duplicate, try not to submit two similar applications through both of the mechanisms. If uh, like, uh, if you're submitting to the call for projects, please make sure that you're applying for the first one. Um, you, you see a red uh, circle around the button that you would need to press. And uh, once uh, once you click on this, um, and here, of course, uh, we don't have time to go through uh, in detail through all the uh, steps of the, um, uh, let's say, application form, but uh, the, the main sections that you're going to see, and I've put a little ribbon on the slide on top, you have the little executive summary that you would have to write and very basic information about the application. I mean, uh, the total budget uh, of the project, the amount that you're requesting, any co-financing, and so on. Then you have a tab uh, number two with the details of the project where you would have to elaborate in all details uh, and provide uh, basically inform what, what would you like to do and uh, define the activities, the deliverables, the uh, dates, uh, plan dates of delivery and so on. This is where you're going to do it. Uh, the third section is the um, organization uh, is where you would have to provide information about your organization, which you're representing. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite, um, it's quite basic. I wouldn't say there's a lot uh, to fill in here, but later um, there's the next section is the budget, which um, our, our colleagues will speak uh, late, late, later uh, in this session about. And then you have the section on supporting documents uh, where you would need to annex um, a list of documentation, both relating to the project itself and to, the, to your uh, organization um, and any, let's say, other documents that are relevant. Uh, the final one is legal and reference documents. And uh, this is basically where you would have to um, agree to Aleph's terms and conditions and uh, do requirements for reporting and any other legal documents. Um, you will basically have to tick the boxes. Uh, now, uh, things to pay particular attention to, um, as Elka already explained, you would have to, when you're uh, explaining the project, you would have to pay attention to explaining how uh, is this related to conflict, climate change, uh, or other crisis, what is the impact? And of course, if you're planning to address it, how are you going to address it? Um, it's very important to be very clear in the definition of activities and deliverables. So what we've tried to do is to provide you with a, uh, uh, the, the, the questions, the, the question relating to this will be in the form of a table, which you would need to fill. And it's supposed to be quite clear. What is the uh, activity? What is the de deliverable or deliverables and so on? So it would be very important to uh, take uh, special, uh, pay special attention to this uh, question. Uh, then, uh, as many of you might know, um, uh, sometimes you would need authorizations and support letters to perform the to implement the project that you're talking about. For instance, uh, if you're planning to restore, restore a historic building uh, uh, somewhere, most often you would need some kind of form of authorization from the local authorities and 
for this, we would like to request you to um, uh, to upload these, uh, if already available, to upload these in the supporting document section. You're going to find uh, a specific uh, uh, a specific question related to this. And in case you have any, um, if you already arranged co-funding, and by the way, co-funding is uh, very much encouraged, uh, so you would you would have the opportunity to elaborate on this in your um, uh, in your application. Um, so thank you. I think this is it on my side. Uh, thank you very much, Elka. If there's any further questions, you can either ask us uh, today or uh, in any case uh, on the Smart Simple platform, you would see that there's an email address which you can contact um, in case you would need any technical support. So thank you very much. Thank you, Adonis. Um, so we'll move to the financial bit. Um, First, in terms of eligible costs, and I think these are also further specified in the um, in the guidelines. So I will not kind of read uh, all the details, but I think what what matters is we do pay salaries. Um, it just has to make sense for the project. Uh, we of course uh, will pay for everything that is related to the conservation uh, projects and so the materials, the contractors. Uh, um, but also travel. Uh, we do, um, since we've been working mostly in conflict areas, so there is the option to uh, to include costs related to security um, and, and risk mitigation and in, in this particular case. Um, communication about the project, um, including uh, dissemination of, of knowledge coming from the project. As I said before, of course, everything related to on-the-job training um, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think what's really important to highlight is administration costs. Sorry, I moved too fast. Administration costs should not exceed 10% of the total budget. Um, so this is the overhead. Um, um, if it's over 10%, uh, we will not be able to support it. Uh, it can be lower than 10%, of course. Um, and uh, if there's uh, equipment purchased during the project, uh, including things like vehicles and, and so on, um, uh, there is a preference for it uh, to be transferred to the local beneficiary uh, in all the cases where that makes sense. Um, so that's on my side and I will hand over to the colleagues from the finance team to explain you a bit more on our budget templates and the requirements there. Ivan, you're yeah. on Thank you. Thank you, Elke. Uh, so yeah, my name is Ivan Dautrich, uh, finance controller here at, uh, at Alif. And I will go uh, quickly through the, the financial aspects of, uh, of the call. Uh, so first of all, the, the budget templates. Uh, so for the partners who have uh, already applied for uh, Alif Grant, uh, you, you will notice that a new budget and uh, financial reporting templates has been uh, developed. The idea is uh, here to, to facilitate the financial monitoring of the projects and the communication with, uh, with Alif. Uh, that uh, new budget template uh, that you can see and extract uh, here on the screen Basically, it follows a very regular structure. You shouldn't be surprised. Uh, it is divided into uh, different budget categories, such as uh, staff cost, uh, consultant equipment, uh, travel, uh, etc. And uh, for each budget line, uh, we are uh, expecting you to, to provide a clear description uh, to specify uh, the unit, the number of unit, the unit cost, uh, etc. For a multi-year project, uh, a forecast uh, breakdown per year is also uh, requested, uh, and on the on the right side, uh, a budget justification uh, is also required. To the ideas here is to to demonstrate the necessity of the of the line, and to provide uh, as well so, some detail in the calculation assumptions. Uh, it's it's very important. Please note that within that new um, budget Excel sheet, we have included. It is not uh, shown here, but uh, we worked. Uh, on a very detailed instructions uh, that you can refer to uh, 
uh, for any questions you may have on how to fill in the budget, uh, keeping in mind that uh, that budget should at the end be a financial uh, retranscription of your uh, project proposal. Uh, thanks. Uh, just um, for, for information, that uh, that new slide uh, is an extract of those uh, instructions. Uh, I, I won't go that much into uh, detail, but uh, it lists all the all the budget categories uh, that make up the budget, with uh, the the type of cost uh, that you should include uh, on it. Uh, so it's just an example, but. Yes, as I uh, mentioned before, the, the instructions are quite clear and really do not hesitate to, to, to refer to uh, if you have any uh, any question. Uh, thanks. Another step uh, which is uh, very important in the contract contractualization process uh, with the, the grantee that we are intending to, to work with is the, the due diligence. Uh, that due diligence is, uh, is included within uh, a broader risk mapping process. Uh, it, it aims to address all the legal, all the financial, the procurement, uh, the reputational risks, uh, and to ensure that the, the, the grantees we are going to work with have a suitable system and processes to properly and appropriately manage the funds, specifically in terms of uh, flow of funds and cash management, uh, accounting and financial management, procurement and asset management, and standard policies and procedures. So those are the, the main categories that we will be assessing. Uh, and it will be done through uh, a questionnaire that uh, that will need to be filled in by the by the applicants. Uh, very important uh, to note that at the end, uh, that process seeks to to establish um, an environment of uh, transparency and accountability between uh, Alif and uh, the future grantee. Uh, and to determine uh, together uh, the risk and all the mitigation measures, uh, the technical assistance, uh, capacity building uh, that we can provide uh, to the to the grantee. The idea here is not just to to control uh, what you do, but to 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 find together uh, solutions. Uh, to to ensure to have a, a proper implementation implementation of the uh, of the project. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, uh, El uh, Very quickly, uh, in terms of uh, financial reporting, um, we also developed a new uh, a new spreadsheet. Uh, once again, I will encourage you to to refer to the to the instructions that I was mentioning before. Uh, I won't go that much into detail. Uh, what is important to note uh, now, and it's quite uh, new uh, in comparison with the old version of the the financial reporting, is that we will be now requiring a detailed transaction list where all the individual expenses uh, will need to be recorded uh, and all the financial reporting table will be linked uh, to that um, uh, to uh, to that uh, transaction list um uh, expenses, yes, uh, of course, they shall follow the original uh, budget structure and they need to be recorded within the, the relevant uh, reporting period. Uh, as a reminder as well, um, budget variance uh, above 10% 10 uh, 10 per uh, budget category, uh, not per budget line, but per budget category, shall be formally approved uh, by ALIF. Uh, that's very important uh, to note. And um, as a reminder, uh, going a bit further, what Elke was mentioning uh, previously, in terms of eligibility, uh, all the expenses that uh, you are going to report uh, to be considered as eligible, they should be reasonable. 
uh, they should be justified. Uh, you be you you should justify the necessity of the expense for carrying out the projects. Uh, those expenses uh, they need to directly uh, be attributable to the to the projects and uh, compliant with the principle of uh, sound management. Further, it uh, can you go back just one second? <laughs> Sorry, uh, all the expenses they need to be um, to be su su substantiated uh, with supporting documents. Uh, they have to be incurred within the scope and the reporting period of the grants, and of course, uh, they shall not be tainted by uncompliant practices. Uh, and we also have a document uh, which is setting up all the ALIF requirements in terms of uh, financial reporting that you can uh, refer to. Uh, and uh, to, to, to finish uh, my aspects, uh, please note uh, that uh, for every project, uh, we will conduct a spot check, uh, which means that for each financial report, Alif uh, will request a supporting documentation for a selection uh, of expenses uh, that were reported in the transaction list. And uh, those, uh, those expenses will be analyzed uh, in the light of uh, the ALIF requirements and in the light of the criterions that I was mentioning uh, previously to ensure uh, the eligibility of, uh, of it. And uh, as a new uh, ALIF policy, uh, please note uh, that any time, at any time of the project, uh, ALIF may also commission uh, external audits uh, to check and confirm uh, the delivery of the funded activity, as well as the compliance uh, of the expenses and the compliance of the report with the, with the requirements. Uh, our policies mention that all the project over uh, 400,000 uh, USD uh, are audited but uh, we can also occasionally assign uh, audits to, to project under the, the selling or uh, 400K. So I think that's it on my hand. Once again, uh, we have uh, several uh, documents, um, policies, um, uh, and other documents that you can refer to uh, to have uh, the, the global ALIF a framework in terms of budgeting, in terms of reporting, and in terms of uh, requirements. Uh, over to you, Elke. Thank you, Ivan. So just to finish, um, a quick update on the timeline. So as uh, I think Adoni has already mentioned, the call is closing on the 21st of November this year at 3 p.m. Um, Geneva time. Uh, this also means that from 3 p.m. 21st November, it will not be possible to submit applications, even if they're already half ready in, in, our, in our tool, because the tool will not be accessible anymore. Um, so please, if you're planning to apply, apply before the 21st of November. Um, we will then um, go through a series of internal and external evaluations uh, in a kind of three, four months that follow, um, that depends a little bit on, as you see, there's a bit of fluctuation in the dates that follow, uh, because this is very much depending on the amount of um, applications that we receive. Um, there's then an evaluation by our scientific committee, uh, which is going to happen towards the end of spring, uh, and a final approval of um, the proposed. So the scientific committee proposals the final set of, of projects, and then the foundation board um, approves them or, or, or does not approve them, uh, which, which is going to happen uh, end of June, uh, beginning of July, something something like that. Um, and then uh, shortly after, uh, there's the official communication on uh, the allocated funding. Um, and that brings us, I think, to if my yeah, to the last uh, part, which are the questions. 
and answers. Uh, if you have any questions after these presentations, do let us know. You can post them in the Q&A and um, I'll, I'll start taking a few. I see some already arrived. So there's one, which is, is there a budget and duration limit for each project? Um, no. So not officially at least. So there's no budget ceiling and no budget bottom. Um, although I guess zero would be would be a bottom. Um, but we we suggest, uh, I mean, most of our projects are kind of small to medium size. Um, as you see, kind of we have a cutoff for audits at 400,000. A lot of projects, overly large majority of projects fall quite far below that threshold. Uh, but then there's, of course, as I mentioned, uh, we are also looking for more symbolic projects on bigger sites, which then logically uh, tend to go for, for a much larger budget. So, so as long as the budget makes sense for what is proposed, uh, we do have uh, a $10 million uh, overall budget for this call. So that also gives you some indication of, uh, of course, if uh, we're not gonna adopt two, two projects of $5 million, let's say. Uh, duration limit, preferably within three years, uh, but also uh, there's no firm limit there. We have quite a bit of projects, especially those dealing with more acute emergencies that have a much shorter duration. And if entirely justified, we could consider uh, longer durations. Um, I see a second question. Is an individual application eligible or must it be through an NGO? Um, our, um, our guidelines do have a section on who is eligible, uh, what kind of institutions. There's no, uh, so these are grants, so they're not for individuals. Um, we do well in the coming months have an opportunity for a couple of types of very small grants for individuals, but projects have to go through preferably an NGO or a civil society organization. And there's a number of other, we can work with universities, for instance, um, but it, it, it cannot be an individual. Then I see the question, are projects outside of Africa eligible? So as I said at the beginning of this session, yes. Uh, but the top priority of this call is for projects in Africa. Um, so that means that the overly large majority of projects and funding within this call will be allocated to Africa. Um, and if anything gets accepted outside of Africa, it will be on an exceptional basis. Um, and of course, also depending on how well they can demonstrate, you know, that they're strongly affected by climate change and, and so on. Um, would there be a project without a physical structure, but where a natural area is considered sacred and under threat to the local community? Uh, I think it could, um, but, but the cultural heritage value has to be very clearly demonstrated um, and, and it's also not clear to me from the formulation of this question whether the threat comes from the local community or there's another threat because the the, the threat does have to be climate change um, but but it, it could be a, an option uh, can you give more details about the administration? So the administration cost is the typical overhead that you have in, in, in a project. So it's everything that would be be related to, to uh, your office running costs, uh, water, electricity, Wi-Fi. Um, so if you put a if you put a budget for that, you don't you don't put it again as, as individual costs in the in the, the project. Can one organization apply for more than one proposal? Yes. I mean, our, our system is open. You can submit 100 proposals if you want to. Um, I cannot guarantee that applying with more projects is going to give you more funded projects in the end. So I think that becomes a strategic decision of your organization, whether you want to fully go for one project that you very solidly um, uh, build up and, and 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 submit or whether you want to spread your options by applying with several 
um, with several projects. And then also, I think uh, whether, um, uh, I think it then also apply, it depends a bit on the capacity of your organization. If you're a very small NGO or if you're a big international organization with presence, for instance, throughout the continent. Um, are international organizations, intergovernmental organizations, universities eligible? Yes, all of that. Um, I, let me look at what else is coming. I'll scroll down. The number of grants allocated, um, we don't know. Uh, so the, there's a budget total, so the 10 million US dollars that I've mentioned before. Um, and that will determine the number of grants allocated uh, in combination with uh, how many projects we receive that meet uh, our criteria and that pass our evaluation and the total budget uh, contained within these projects. So if we have... Uh, I, I, I think I've made the, the comparison earlier already. If our plan is not to adopt two projects of $5 million, but of course, if there's two projects of a million dollars, um, that, that already also cuts quite a bit, big part of the total pot. Uh, if we have a lot of applications that are kind of in the 50 to 100,000 range, then automatically we would have a lot more grants allocated than if most of our applications are, are, are for big grants. So that is difficult for us to predict. The only thing that we have um, determined beforehand is the total amount of funding that we will allocate to this call. Um, please share your definition of intangible heritage. Um, <laughs> I mean, we... we for us, anything that's culture heritage in the broadest sense possible um, is is eligible as long as there is a clear demonstration um, that uh, it is facing a risk. Uh, and, and of course, um, in line with human rights standards and 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 all that kind of things. Uh, we were quite closely related to UNESCO and they're a member of our board, so you can go look at their definitions. Um, but but so uh, intangible heritage can be anything from traditions, traditional knowledge to festivals to um, music and, and so on. Um, what is your selection process? What does your selection process look like? Is it in part automated through your system? Um, there is no automated part of the selection process. So as soon as you've submitted your application through the online system, the rest of the selection is done by us and our external experts. There is a first selection based on eligibility criteria. So that looks at whether you're a type of organization that can apply or not. If you're an individual, for instance, you will no longer be considered. Um, whether it's a project about heritage, um, if you, for instance, uh, let's say you're proposing to build an airstrip in uh, Madagascar, um, you will not be considered. So these are kind of um, very basic eligibility criteria. Um, and then after that, there's a more thorough uh, process that looks at the criteria in these four categories that I described. Um, and that is done both by our team of project managers um, and by a, a whole group of external reviewers. There's normally two reviewers assigned per project. Um, our own evaluation is combined with that of the external reviewers, and based on that, we make a short list of uh, the best scoring projects, which are then brought to um, the scientific committee, who can give further recommendations, uh, take, you know, make other proposal suggestions, and then based on 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 that conclusion, we uh, propose a final list for uh, funding to our foundation board, which is the one who takes the ultimate decision, um, but who is not a, a technical advisory body. So they just, uh, they take the decision based on recommendations from both the secretariat and the, the 
scientific committee. Um, could regions affected by earthquakes be considered as affected by climate change? Um, I mean, I don't think that uh, earthquake is necessarily uh, uh, caused by climate change, but it's not because an earthquake happened that the region cannot be affected by climate change. I think it can be two, um, two separate things. Um, so it would very much depend on what uh, threat to your particular site or your particular heritage you are proposing uh, in this project. And if it is a threat by an earthquake, caused by an earthquake, or a threat caused by climate change. Um, I do would like to mention that um, you've seen when Adonis was talking about the smart simple system that our emergency relief grants are also open. These are always open 365 days a year and things like earthquakes are eligible under that, um, but it is for uh, limited funding only. So it's up to $75,000 for emergency actions. Um, this is not the topic of this call, but for people dealing with disaster um, that would not necessarily fall under this call or in areas that's, that are outside of Africa, uh, you're always welcome to either apply for ER or to contact us directly so that we can see uh, what options are available um, to help you. Again, uh, usually in acute emergencies, these are, are, are relatively limited um, uh, grants uh, in terms of budget ceiling. So it's 50,000 or 75,000, depending on the system. Uh, is a private company eligible to apply? Yes. Um, although usually, or at least in the experience that we have so far, um, Private companies are selected if we know there's no alternative. So we do encourage uh, NGOs or civil society uh, above private companies, but it's you can apply. Um, so I think we were reaching the end. If I if I see this. Um, uh, I see one which says, in a proposal presented by a partnership, should the information about each partner be provided in the system? Yes, you'll see that when you apply, when you open the system, um, there, there is information and more detailed information for needed for the main applicant. But... Um, um, But you'll also be requested to provide information on uh, other partners involved. Um, are spin-off companies combining previous experience and heritage building capacity design implementation of projects eligible to present for a grant? Yes. I mean, any, any, I think this, this relates to what I already said in terms of private companies. Um, so, so uh, yeah, anyone, anyone is, is, is allowed to apply, although if you'll see in our guidelines what are kind of the preferred uh, types of, of, of grantees. Is the general conservation, protection, and promotion of tangible heritage not supported by a leaf? In other words, if we are not affected by conflict or it does not directly relate to the impact of climate change, um, not under this call, no. Um, so under this call, we really look for projects impacted by climate change. And it can be the combination of uh, the nexus climate change and conflict, which is very much encouraged, but uh, conservation projects that have nothing to do with climate change nor with conflict uh, will not be considered. I also saw a question, I believe, uh, when I was scrolling through very much uh, at the top of the Q&A list, which was asking something about supporting projects within the EU. Um, I mean, first of all, the priority is Africa, um, which 
thus far does not include the EU. Um, and uh, the guidelines, I think, very clearly explain that we, we do have a focus on vulnerable countries. And with that, we don't mean vulnerable to climate change, which would be large parts of, of the planet, uh, but countries in which the authorities, the public system uh, is unable to cope with the effects of climate change that they are facing uh, without additional support from the outside. So unless this is also the case for the EU country that uh, the person asking the question was thinking of, I think it will be very difficult to argue um, on a kind of global scale that that's the EU, the specific EU country would would be uh, vulnerable in, 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 in that kind of definition. Uh, can we apply as a twinning collaboration between Jordan and a country in Africa? Yes, of course. Any any kind of co combinations? I haven't uh, mentioned that when I was talking earlier, but um, any kind of partnerships, uh, projects that cover uh, various countries or regional collaborations, uh, for instance, with different type, with a certain type of typology of heritage that you can find in, in, in different countries are very much encouraged. Um, as long as you can show that the, the applicant is able to work in these different countries or that there's a good kind of management structure set up for the project that allows really properly linking these things, uh, these different countries, these different sites or these different forms of heritage, then that is, that is something uh, we, we very much encourage you to look at. Will the contribution of other donors or funds in the budget of the institution be considered for the evaluation? So yes, uh, I assume this is this is referring to co-funding. Um, if there is co-funding, very much encouraged. It's not a requirement, um, but if we see that it's a project that has already the support uh, in part of another donor, uh, it does. Um, it, it, it is a pro for us because it means being part of a bigger project. It also uh, shows, indicates that there's other donors who already uh, have faith in, in, in this being a good and a relevant project. So it's definitely encouraged. Can anyone apply for a single World Heritage Site that is being affected by climate change or need more than, no, you can apply for one site. I mean, of course, uh, most of our projects focus on one site. It also doesn't have to be a World Heritage Site. We have a lot of projects focusing on, on local heritage sites. Um, so it definitely doesn't have to be a, a, a series of, of sites. We're very happy with projects for one site only. Um, perhaps we're... You talked about capacity building. When are you planning to organize heritage conservation skills training in Africa. I mean, as I explained, Alif is a, is a donor, we're a fund. We are not organizing training sessions ourselves. Uh, we do encourage people who are following the session or listening to us online afterwards or interested by this call to apply with projects for heritage uh, conservation training, uh, but it's not something that Alif will do. So. Uh, we will not organize training. It's not the type of work that Alif does. Um, I think, sorry, it's a long list, so I don't know if we're slowly reaching the end, maybe not yet. Um, the climate change factor or target areas seem related to the Africa coastal areas, whereas in our case, we are focusing on a very extreme situation or impact of climate change in the mountainous regions of the Himalaya. Do you think it would be impacting our application? No, I think I think um, I think projects from from other vulnerable areas, so areas in in countries, that are very much affected um, by climate change, that, um, that are in situations where uh, the public capacities to address uh, the, the impact are limited, are very much in, encouraged to do so. And I know that the Himalayas are not in Africa, uh, but if you apply, we will definitely look at 
your application. Um, and so it's not such even for Africa that we only look at coastal areas. Uh, we we do also very much look at inland areas, uh, the Sahel, for instance, uh, desert areas, uh, mountainous areas, forest areas. It's, it's all OK. Um, any anything is welcome and and if there's uh, participants here i've mentioned many times focus is priority is africa but it's not exclusive if you are facing a major a major climate threat that you can clearly demonstrate in another part of the world in a vulnerable country uh please do um please do apply um because there is a chance that you will get funded can a heritage preinct or private dwelling be eligible? Yes, um, it's it's not uh, it's not excluded. Uh, we do. I mean, we mentioned at some point that we need uh, the necessary support letters, and it's the same for private buildings. So we need to know that, for instance, the owners are okay with you carrying out this project, and there needs to be a clear justification in terms of uh, sustainability of the project. Um, so that that's, uh, you know, what are you going to do with the building afterwards? Is the family going to move back there? Um, how are they going to maintain the building? But we already have, if you scan through our website, we, we have projects, for instance, in Yemen, uh, where we are restoring private, uh, private houses. Can the project be simply an action research? In theory, yes, but it's very much encouraged to be linked to either an operational project or a capacity building project but it can be so if it's a very solid project um, you do at least will meet the eligibility criteria then afterwards it depends on on what we receive and how comprehensive the competition is okay um, i'm also looking at my colleagues to see if we're there's anything else that they picked up that we haven't yet answered? I just they do keep on seeing uh, questions popping in. So, um, but I think we've by and large answered everything. Um, so I'll I'll keep it at that. Um, just as a reminder, you will all receive the link to um, the recorded version of this. You're welcome, once you're working on your proposal, you're welcome to contact us at grants at aliffoundation.org um, and, and, uh, and, and we'll be ready to help you throughout the, the application process. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll look forward to receiving your projects. <laughs>